Lately, I've had a, a lot of different people tell me things like, hey, Francis, I follow you on Twitter, and it's, it's, really, it's really helped my walk with the Lord, or I follow you on Instagram, or I help you, you know, I follow you on Facebook, and, and that's very flattering, <laughs> but there's one problem. I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Instagram, I don't Facebook. Um, there's people who pretend they're me and they put pictures of my wife up online and say, oh, I love her, and, and they'll just create this own life and, and they'll quote me and, uh, you know, but I, I don't do any of that because in my mind, you know, I got to a point where I was communicating so much to masses of people and it was taking me away from discipleship and truly making disciples and getting deep with some individuals. And I, I was just always in the public eye and I wanted to get away from that and just get with individuals. And, and, and But we had a meeting with some of my staff. They're going, well, what do you do, Francis? Because these guys are quoting you, and they're not saying anything bad, and it actually is helping a lot of people. And it, I mean, that's a tough discussion to have. And they're going, well, you know, it's harmless. They're quoting you. They're pretending you. But to me, I go, that's so weird, though. Like, because they're going, do we shut them down? You know, do we try to shut them down? Or do you just let them keep going because they're go doing good things? And I go, there's just a weirdness of the fact that I'm not really behind it. And we're letting this thing go. And, uh, but it made me think, you know, I think a lot of times we'll put on events, we'll do church services where we quote him and... We'll, we'll, we'll give him praise, but I just go, gosh, is he really behind it? Okay, I mean, it's okay, you know, but, but I, I was just praying for tonight. I go, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to create a fake Facebook page right here. I don't want to put a fake, you know, Twitter handle here. I, I, I want it really to be you and not just us getting in a room and talking about him. I go, God, I want you to be the source of this. I want you to be behind it. God, I want this to be the real thing. I, I, I thought about Moses. I, I love that passage, don't you? In, in, in Exodus 33, when, when God says, look, I'll give you the promised land. Go, here's everything you ever wanted, right? He, he says in Exodus 33, he says, in, in, in fact, verse 2, he says, I'll send an angel before you. And I'll drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you. Lest I consume you on the way because you're a stiff-necked people. He says, man, here's everything you ever wanted. Here's the promised land. Go, I'm even going to send an angel. He'll prepare the way you can have it. And you know Moses' response was, no, no way. It's not good enough. I, I don't want that. I don't want that unless you go with us. I don't want to go. I'm not going unless you go, God. I don't want to be. I don't care. And then I thought about how, you know, God was offering them the promised land. And Moses says, I don't want it. But I wonder how many of the people would have taken that deal. You know? And I guess I want to start off asking you, what is, what is your promised land? Because I would hate it if God just said, you want a big church? Here, here, take, here, here's a big church. You want a big church? Is that what you always wanted, to have a big church? Did you want to grow? Here, here, have a big congregation. Are you happy now? You want to write a big book? You want a, you want a best-selling book? Here, 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 let me give you the thoughts. And you just pen it out, okay? You're going you're gonna to write a great book. Go on, do that. And then and in your mind, is that what you want? I mean, or, you know, where it's devoid of God, where do you want him with you? I mean, I had to be back there just repenting again and coming before God and going, God, I don't want to just get up there and preach a sermon where everyone says, oh, that was good. That was a great sermon. Man, that was the best one of the whole conference. Man, way to go. I go, no, God, I, I don't want that. I just want to know you're here with me. I want to know that when I'm on that stage, you're right here. Man, because we can lose touch with this. And we pursue these things and these things that we want that are good things. 
But at the end of the day, does it drive you crazy unless you know God is with you? And you know, okay, God, you're watching me from heaven. It's really your spirit flowing through me right now. These are your words. Don't just give me what I want in the flesh, God. I, I have to have you. How badly do you want Jesus? How badly do you want to know that even as you're sitting there right now listening, it means the world to you, everything to you, that Jesus is right there with you. His presence is with you. His spirit dwells in you. And you go, that's all I want. That's all I want. I, I just have to have you with me. Because we start praying for all these other things. We get stressed out trying to compete with other people. We see what other people are doing. We want to match up to them somehow. And somehow we lose sight. And unlike Moses, we're, we're happy and we're pursuing this promised land and forgetting all about this relationship with him. But I love Moses' words where he said, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And it was just my time with the Lord back there in the room going, God, I don't want to go up there. I don't want to go up there unless you're behind this. I don't want to just quote you and make up a little Facebook page for you when you're not really doing it. You're not really saying it through me. I want you with me, Father. Because otherwise, I mean, why in the world do people even listen to me? I said, God, it's only because you've been with me these years. And they see it. They, they look at this human being and go, man, he couldn't have done that. That wasn't his power. He couldn't have done that. And there's just something about you being upon him. It's that blessing, that anointing that we all want. And is that still the desire of your life where you go, God, I don't care if I'm talking to three people on Sunday. If I know you're with me as I make those disciples, those could be the ones. And I had such a great time back there, too, uh, getting to spend some time with Jack Hayford, whom I just adore. Um, I love him. And just to have that conversation. But I was thinking about after he left, I go, wow, that might be the oldest man I've ever had a logical conversation with. Uh, I mean, I, that's not a bad, and I'm sure there's some of you older in here. I just don't talk to people that, that but uh it was just, it was powerful, but, you know, I just, I, 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 I was able to sit him down and go, just to ask him, I go, hey, Jack, what, what do you have to say to me? You know, I'm 46, what do you, what do you have to say? Because I, I, I see the world changing so much, and I see, you know, all the social media and everything, just, just, it's just, everything's pulling at me. It doesn't feel like it did 20 years ago. It seems so much easier then, and this and that, and he's, and, and he just, in, in a moment of clarity, just goes, you know, we worship a God who's not bound by time. And there are truths here that are timeless. And don't feel like you got to keep up with all the trends of the time. Because you worship a God that's beyond all of that. And stay close to him. Focus on those things that are true. Man, it was so good. And it's so good just to hear from someone who's been walking with the Lord for that long. Praise God for that. I... I had a phone call um, uh, maybe a month ago from uh, one of my heroes. He's, he's from India, uh, and he leads about three million people, so larger than most of our churches. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I admire anyone more on the earth because of his walk with the Lord. He plants about 17 churches a day on average. Just amazing the things this, this guy has done. But he called me about a month ago and he was crying. Never cried before me before, just crying. 
because he had heard of another moral failure here in America, another pastor of a large church, and just started crying. Just, he just was crying for the country, crying for the pastors that he's met here. In the, not in any judgmental way, he was just sad. And he goes, he goes, Francis, it feels like the people here in America, even the pastors, I, and when I'm done talking to them, I pray for them. I go, God, I wish that man knew you. I wish he knew Jesus, like really knew him, really loved Jesus. I, I, I wish, and then again, he's just weeping. He just got, and he made a statement, man, that's been sticking with me for this last month. I keep thinking about it. He just said it in passing, but he goes, it feels like the people in this country are fine. They're content. They're happy to just meet with Moses rather than going up the mountain themselves. I kept thinking about that. I go, that's so good. That's so true. It's like we, we, we talk about people so much. We lift this guy up, that girl up, this band up, that speaker. Oh, if I could meet him. Oh, if I could meet him. And it was such a clear revelation of, man, do you understand? You can actually go up the mountain. Man, that's crazy. But most of us are dying to take a picture with Moses, dying to go, man, Moses, wait, you talked to God, you met with him, what was that like? And our churches are filled with people coming to hear from Moses. Hey, Moses, were you with God this week? Did you tell me about it? Tell me about it. And our job is to go up that mountain ourselves, but then to direct our people and go, no, you can actually walk up there. I'm telling you, you've got to get to him. You've got to come into your presence. I mean, you can stand before that burning bush. You can stand before the God who dwells in unapproachable light, like just you and him. Man, as he was weeping for the state of the church in America and just going, man, when's the last time you just walked up the mountain by yourself? Going, man, there's so much going on, but, and I don't want to talk to anyone. I mean, why do I want to talk to people? Why am I so excited about this guy's opinion or that guy's opinion? Why am I following this guy's little tweet or that guy's, you know, you know his blog or this? Oh, I just want to see the next century. I just want to see that. And it's like, do you get it? Do you get it? Like you can approach him. Like you can literally enter into his presence, walk up that mountain and have this divine encounter with him. Man, don't settle for something less than that. Don't settle for just reading someone's book or listening to someone's message. Like, get on that mountain. Because this is our problem. Our problem is not that our churches aren't cool enough or keeping up with the times. Our problem is we as leaders are getting distracted by so many things that we're no longer walking up that mountain and coming down with this glow that people can't understand. I mean, if you're an unbeliever, think about this. If you're an unbeliever walking into a gathering of Christians, what would you want to see? What would persuade you? Would it be a, a tight band? A gifted communicator? I mean, wouldn't you want to walk in and go, wow, that, that, that person up there had a connection with God I've never seen. It's like he was just with him. It was like that gal, she knew God. He answered her prayers. I've never met anyone like that. I mean, isn't that what you would want to see as you walked in? And yet we spend all our time creating these other things that are a substitute. How close are you to Jesus right now? How much time do you spend on the mountain? If I were to ask God, if I were to come into his presence and ask about you and say, how's her fellowship with you? How's his time with you? What would God say about that? I, I know tonight I, I was supposed to talk about making disciples.
but I think our problem is maybe some of us are making disciples and we're duplicating ourselves, but we ourselves are not close to Jesus. And so why do we even want two of you? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Serious, I mean, think about that. If we're stressed out running from this place to that place and doing all this stuff, trying to keep up, why do we want to multiply that? But if you, I mean, I think about it, man, what if this was an army of people? I mean, literally, this is all we need. All we need is for all of you to go up that mountain on your own. Like if you were just literally one of those people that just spent hours in the presence of God every week, where it's you and him, and you're so tight with him, and then we come into a crowd or a gathering like this. Can you imagine but so often we're looking for things like this to kind of charge us up, you know, rather than, no, I, I've been there. I've been there with him. And I just want to gather with other believers who've been there with him. And what if your congregation was filled with people who literally think about this? Imagine every person in your church having walked up that mountain by themselves during the week and had this encounter with God where they suddenly... Who cares about Moses? Who cares about Joshua? Who cares about anyone else? I just encountered the living God. Imagine if everyone in your congregation did that. What kind of congregation would that be? I mean, what else matters? You guys, this isn't rocket science. I mean, you look in the scriptures, it's always been about those who knew Jesus, who really knew him and what he did through those people. It's everything. See, in this room, there's, there's some brilliant people in this room. Some of you guys are brilliant leaders, brilliant thinkers. Some of you are scholars. Your minds are just way beyond where mine would go. And you can come up with great books. You can come up with great teachings. You can come up with great strategies for church growth. But at the end of the day, is God Almighty behind it? Is he the one that's causing and creating that? I, I was reading uh, Isaiah 30 the other day. Isaiah 30, verse 1 says, Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. God says to these people, man, you came up with a brilliant plan. You thought through, okay, where's the most powerful leaders? Where's the greatest army? Let me go to them. Let me recruit. Let me get them on my side. And he goes, man, that's a great plan. Problem is, it's not mine. You didn't even ask me about that. That wasn't the plan I had. And then later on, I love what he says in verse 15. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, no, we'll flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away. We'll ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. In verse 18 says, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Because you just went off into your brilliant plans. You used that one-tenth of a brain that we all use. And you came up with this brilliant plan, didn't you? And so guess what's going to happen? Because you, you just didn't even get it. It was in quietness. If you had just rested in me, it would have been all different. But I'm going to make sure you fail because you didn't rest in me. And I, I want to be gracious to you because that's who I am. But I'm going to wait. 
I'm going to wait to be gracious to you. I'm going to wait till you give up on all your plans and you see that this apparent fruit isn't fruit that really lasts because you didn't really abide in me. I'm going to wait till you see. And you go back to your roots. Remember when you were young? Remember before you knew what you were doing and how you just depended on me and things would happen and you couldn't even explain it in that awe? I'm going to wait till you get back to that. But right now, go ahead. Trust in your chariots. You got a good church growth book? Go, go trust in that. Bring in some consultants. Come on, trust in these things. They'll help you get everything fixed. Go ahead, try it. See what happens. Meanwhile, God Almighty saying, I'm going to wait. But my eyes are going to roam to and fro the earth. I'm going to see, man, whose heart's really committed to mine? Who's, whose heart is really blameless? I love that verse, right? You remember the context of it? King Asa, in the 36th year, he started to trust the king of Syria. And he goes, well, let's make an alliance. Let's make an alliance. And then, and then we'll, we'll go against Israel together. And God's saying, well, what are you doing? 35 years you trusted me, and now you're going to make an alliance with some guy? You're going to trust in his chariots? He goes, because you relied on him, I'm going to make sure you fail. It's, it's the same pattern all throughout the scripture. Who really trusts in him? Who believes in him anymore? Who believes in this timeless truth that as long as I walk with him, as long as I abide in him, I'm going to bear a lot of fruit. It's not fruit that I can just tweet about and show a picture and Instagram, look at all these. No, it's just this fruit that's going to last. Things will happen even after you die from your fruit. These things will just carry on. You'll see them in eternity. I think about Gideon, right? Isn't that a great story? I mean, sometimes we get on Gideon and it's like, man, you saw the fire and then you had the fleece thing and then you had another fleece thing. And what, but what was that all about? Gideon was just going, okay, God, I just need to know that you're with me. Okay, I, I don't need everyone else. I just need to know that you're with me. And once you're with me, once I know here, just let me make sure again, I'm, I just got to know you're with, okay, he's with me. Okay, fine. Okay, dwindle down the army. I don't care. 30,000, 10,000, 5,000. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter anymore. I know God's with me. So 300, fine. Give me 300. I don't really care because God Almighty is right here with me. I saw the fleece. He's with me. So we'll take on any army. That's, that's what Jonathan says. Remember Jonathan when he just has his armor bearer, you know, in 1 Samuel 14. He goes, you know what? It doesn't matter. Everyone's scared. Everyone's hiding in the caves. Come on, armor bearer, just you and me. If the Lord is with us, that's all we need, just the two of us. We can do this. That's the way David was. 1 Samuel 30, when, when, when the, the armies came, you know, raided Ziklag, took all of their wives and kids, and, and, and everyone's gone, everyone's crying, and then his whole army, his own army wants to kill him. What does it say? It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. Wait a second, you just lost your family, you're weeping with all of your men, then suddenly all your men turn against you, and somehow, because you know the living God, because that's the one thing you seek, you're able to strengthen yourself in the Lord. And you go, okay, I got this. I got this. That's why Paul says, look, all the other stuff that I did, and I did more than all of you, I count it all rubbish. I just want to know Christ. Me with Christ, knowing the power of his resurrection, I want to know everything about him. I want to feel his suffering. I want the fellowship. I want to be like, oh, just like you suffered. Look, I'm suffering with you. I want everything. I just want that fellowship with Jesus so much. And I count that all that other stuff I've ever done, which is more than all of you. He goes, it's all garbage. It's all dung. Compared to knowing him, being found in him. That's all this is about. I really only had one goal this evening as I pray to go, God, what, what do I want out of this? 
God, if I could convince you to go up the mountain by yourself, you don't need me, you don't need anyone else. In fact, it's better without us. Just go up that mountain. That's all I, that's all I hope for as I pray for the four square denomination, my brothers and sisters. What do I pray for? I pray for you as a leader. Come on, God, may they know you deeply. May they not get distracted keeping up with the times. Most of us are old enough to remember the times when there weren't so many distractions and there was a, just more of a clear channel. And, and if we could get that back and be focused on that and teach the next generation just how to get up the mountain, that's it. And to show them through living life where when they're walking side by side with you, they're going, man, he's always leaving to be alone with him. She's always going early in the morning to get into his presence. That that's a disciple that we're making. That's a type of discipleship that's happening. And then we come down having met with God. I do so many of these conferences and these messages and sometimes I leave just going, gosh, was that in the flesh or did I really experience you and did they really experience you and is there fruit that lasts? And I prayed today that you'd have real encounters with God that you'd give up on trying to build the perfect staff that you empty yourself of oh if I had that guy on my staff if I had that person in my congregation and you just depended 100% on God here's what I'd like us to do um I'm not going to try to manipulate anything or come up with a sad story to make you cry or something. Um, I just want to see the power of God move. And it's something internal that I can't explain. Man, I, I know there are times when the Spirit moves and there's these external manifestations of the Spirit and yet, the, I, I believe that tonight, what I believe God wants is this for it to be something inward that no one else can explain. Like, I can't explain what it's like when I'm just like, I feel like God and I are just one being and, and we're so connected and I just want to get away from the rest of the world and just be with him. And I could just, even as much as I love my wife and kids, and it's just like I, I, I can't even think about them right now because you and I and I'm with the God of the universe and you can't see that. And I, I'm doing a poor job explaining it, but I think you know there's like something that happens where no one else sees it. It's just you and him and that's what I'm praying for. And I know there's some of you, man, it's been weeks, months, maybe years since you've had that. And you justify it going, but I'm doing good stuff. I'm carrying out these plans that he didn't ask me to do, but I, I'm running, I'm doing this. And you just feel like it's good stuff, but you know what I'm talking about. And you're going, man, it hasn't been there. You can pretend it's there. You can fake it. And no one's going to question you because you're a leader. And they're going to assume you have this with the Lord. But it's not there. And I'm praying for that inward time with Jesus right now. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have the worship team. Maybe just play softly in the background. And I just want to invite you to the mountain. Not that you need my invitation. Sometimes we just need some space where this isn't a time to talk to anyone else. 
okay, there's no counseling tonight. You can do that tomorrow. Whatever problems you have, I just want you to just picture yourself walking up the mountain. Man, if it helps you to walk up and get on your knees just to, to drown out any noise or, you know, just even to be a little separated from the people. Whatever you need, I don't know what it takes for you. But I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God would just uh, connect with you right now, that he would pursue you. Where deep calls out to deep. And somehow your spirit is becoming one with his right now. Just picture yourself. Close your eyes if it helps. Just picture yourself leaving the city, the village, and walking up to the mountain. Because you want to be in His presence alone. The one who knows everything about you. That's everything. He knows how long it's been. Just walk to Him right now.